Let's just kind of jump right in here. Give give our readers an overview of what Second Chance is is about and kind of what drew you to this project. Uh, Second Chance is a story about um, Richard Davis, who um, is a very brave man and a very unusual man. He invented the modern day bulletproof vest, concealable body armor. And to prove that it worked, he shot himself point blank over um, 190 times. And um, when he invented this, he was a, a out of work pizzeria owner. So it's really kind of a rags to riches story for him. Um, but it's about a lot more than that. It's about um, the lives we tell ourselves to move forward, the, the mythology that people want to believe as a society or as a group. Um, it's about friendship, it's about deception. It's a, it's a kind of a long, decades long story about this inventor, salesman, uh, founder of a huge company, and a lot of the people that were involved in his life over these decades. So, so early in the film, kind of piggybacking off of what you're saying, early in the film, you describe his story with the words as a metaphor for, for you know, um, our country, and you use the words absurd and frightening. This is about 10 minutes into the movie. As this becomes more and more true for where we're at as a society, what do you hope kind of reader, uh, uh, people realize, viewers realize about where we're at and where we're headed? Well, that's for everyone to take away on their own. I mean, um, there's a moment in the film, there's a character uh, uh, in a way opposing, um, Richard is his character, Aaron, Aaron Westrick. He's a police officer who was shot and saved by Richard's vest. So in a way, Richard saved this man. As he, Richard has saved over a thousand lives with his invention. And um, Aaron at some point becomes a whistleblower in a very important case uh, surrounding Second Chance, the company. And there's some, <laughs> In terms of deception, there's some things about Richard's past, including his origins and the mythology around him that fall into question. There's an unreliable storytelling and narrator here. And what I found amazing in that moment was that Aaron Westrick said he prefers to believe in the myth and the legend. And that there's something so true in that for us as a society, um, in a way it reminded me of the great film by John Ford, the man who shot Liberty Valance, um, where they say print the legend and people want to believe that. And, you know, it's not easy to believe in, in what is true. And these days it's not even clear what is true. We don't know. And the film delves into some of those questions. Right. And it does a really, really great job of kind of exploring those questions without necessarily wanting to answer them because everybody kind of has their different ideas of what happened. And, you know, some people are more suspicious of of Richard than others. Um, and, and regarding the product, the Second Chances product itself, the, the bulletproof vest, it's one of those things that we're all pretty aware of, but we don't really know the full story behind how it was made. And so as you got deeper into this project, was there anything that you found shocking about this backstory, like that you found particularly shocking? Well, the most amazing thing is that he invented it out of nothing. I mean, he had no money. He had, he was a former pizzeria owner. Yeah. And he actually sewed materials together by hand in his basement and started testing it by shooting at it in his basement of a townhouse, which frightened his neighbors, you know. So the fact that really, which is something very American, right, that these, these creating things out of nothing and launching a multi-million dollar business out of your basement, this is something so, so truly American. That, that part of it... Um, that was really astounding. And, and really, again, as I said, his bravery, that, that to prove that it worked, he was prepared to shoot himself point blank in the chest, in, you know, and thank God he filmed it. You know, We had access to all these great archives. You know, He's also a movie maker. He made eight hours of film. Right, yeah. You know, recreations of cops and, and, and cops shooting at bad guys, bad guys shooting at cops, you know, comedy film, you know, propaganda films to, get people more frightened by, you know, bad guys with guns. So they yeah. were buying the product and increasing this escalation of weapons and armor. So it was all everywhere we turned, there was another layer to the story. Right. So, so, and as you were, cause with the documentaries, um, a lot of the, the, the finished product is shaped in the editing room. 
And so what kinds, like, how did, how did editing this film shape the way that you told the story and how did it, I mean, did it change any of the elements that we see on the screen or was, did you have a pretty um, solid idea of how you wanted to go about this right off the bat? No, I, I, I didn't know. And, and when you go to start shooting, um, even a fiction film, but even more in documentary, when we went to start filming Richard, he, he was not what we expected. Um, so everything starts to change and evolve as you're shooting. The editing process took quite some time. I worked with a great editor, Aaron Wickenden, who cuts a lot for Morgan Nelville. And um, it took a while to shape the film, to find it. Um, how do you play with the unreliable narrator? When do you reveal elements of the story that are suddenly twisted on their head and it's not what you thought? It took time to find that shape. And, um, and also, I, I, I want to say I like Richard Davis. Um, I don't agree with a lot of his philosophies. I, I disagree with them. He's made some very serious mistakes that cost people, and in, 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 in some cases, it cost someone their life. Um, but he was also very brave. He was charming. He was generous with us. He was generous with a lot of people. And even the people he hurt, even in the, you see in the film, they still talk about him in some loving way. And I was interested in that contradiction of, a, of, of his character and the reaction he elicited out of people. Um, so finding that balance in the editing room took some time. Aaron was great at that. And um, at a certain point, I showed it to a, a lot of people, a, a lot of different filmmaker friends, Werner Herzog and Joshua Oppenheimer. And Joshua spent three, four hours on a Zoom call with me talking about an early cut. And that was very instrumental in finding the shape of the film. And then he saw it again, we talked again, and, and he came on board as an EP. And that was really helpful um, in terms of shaping the film. Mm -hmm. so, so you said that at the beginning of this, of this answer, you said that um, Richard was not what you expected. Can you kind of clue me into what you did expect? Like what were you, when you got to him, were you apprehensive or? When the producers pitched the idea to me, they pitched it as a fiction film. They said they were gonna make the doc and they wanted to know if I would make a fictional story out of it. I think it would actually be a great fictional film and I hope someone makes it. But the more I heard them talk and the more I saw the footage, I wanted to make the doc. And the footage they had provided me and the documents and what they told me, it really sounded like it was going to be a rags to riches, rise and fall story. And that Richard was gonna be this very um, charming person who was gonna go deep into the mistake that he had made, um, let's say with the Zylon vest specifically, which comes in the second half of the film. But the more we dug into the film, the more re we realized there were other mistakes. And then when I started to talk to him, I realized he wasn't that willing or able to go to the depth of facing some of the things from his past. Um, going back to what we said earlier, he also wants to believe some sort of a, le a legend or a myth or a deception. Um, so I didn't have full access, I feel, to the inside of him, or maybe he doesn't have full access to that or doesn't want to go there, which I understand. Not everyone wants to do that. It's not an easy thing to do. So at that point in the shooting of the film, it opened up to the other characters. You know, I started to realize to understand Richard and the story, we need to understand the people around him. In a way, like in Citizen Kane, we understand Kane through people around him. So his second wife, Kathleen, became so important to the story, her profound way of seeing things and speaking, or Aaron Westrick and his wife, Kim, who was such an eloquent speaker, or Tim Pazensky, the teenage teenager who's now an adult that had a very bizarre and deadly encounter almost with with Richard Davis. So these characters started to inform the story more than I had imagined when I got into it. Right, right. Well, so, so one of the things that struck me is towards the end of, of the movie, Aaron Westrick, the, the officer who, um, you know, worked with, with Richard and Clifford, these two men who shot each other and they, they, re, they meet at the end of the movie. I mean, was that something that you planned from the beginning or was that an organic thing that you kind of figured out needed to happen halfway through? Yeah, I was shooting, the first round of shooting happened as soon as I locked picture on White Tiger, which was in November, 2020. We went up and shot the first round in Michigan, in Northern Michigan. And in talking to Aaron Westrick, the police officer who was saved by Richard Davis's vest and then came to work for Richard Davis, 
he started, I started asking him questions about who was the man that shot you. And the more I heard about that man, the more I, I knew I had to meet him. And so when we went back in April, 2021, um, I asked the producers to find some people and one of them was Clifford Washington. And my hope was that Clifford would be an interesting man, a good speaker. And of course he was, he was a very profound speaker and, and had some very deep things to tell us. And um, once I thought of him, I thought structurally it would be good for him to come only in the end of the film as a kind of out of nowhere surprise character that would offer a antidote or the antithesis of Richard's philosophies, um, that he would negate them in his being, in his presence. And the idea of them meeting together happened while I was there shooting. I said, my God, they, they should meet one another. And they had not met in 40 years since the night they shot each other. And so I asked, I asked them, would you like to meet? And they, you sensed that they needed to do that. They needed to, when you feel it in the scene that for 40 years they have needed to have this reconciliation. And um, that challenges Richard's beliefs, you know. Now there's two, again, like Richard's a contradiction there, these two life forces are con contradicting one another. Right, right. Well, and so you, you talked earlier about how Richard was not super able to dive very deeply into how he felt about things for whatever reason was it did you encounter any any hesitancy or, or fear from anybody else because this this movie gets very raw and was there did anybody else kind of resist or kind of express hesitancy at having to be that vulnerable on camera i think people revealed themselves as best they could and as 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 they felt they should and with some people maybe i felt more fortunate that they were willing to go to very difficult places and other people, perhaps they were less eager to do that, which is, I understand, it's not an easy thing to do. You're asking right. a lot from someone to reveal themselves. Right. I mean, yeah, it's, it's you know, it, it can be kind of a big ask. And so it's really cool that a lot of those people showed up and gave really, really heartfelt and powerful yeah. answers. I mean, it was really powerful. Um, yeah, I, 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 I thank you for saying that. I think so too. I'm amazed that some of them did go to those places, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, because I mean, there, you know, there's not a script. You, you, you don't really know what these people are going to say, you know. So um, that had to have been really rewarding for you as, as, a, as a filmmaker to, to kind of elicit these um, responses from people. Yeah. One thing I, I learned in making two short docs and, and speaking to Werner Herzog about his approach was when you ask a question and the person answers, don't ask another question so quickly. Wait. Because in the pause, oftentimes, Emotionally, people reveal themselves, but they may suddenly start talking again about something you've never thought about or you didn't even ask them. They just want to talk about something. And so a lot of times I just wouldn't say anything. And suddenly they would just start talking about what was on their mind that I didn't even know about. And that learning that strategy or technique from Werner was uh, very helpful. It's just such a great documentary and you do such a great job threading it all together, but you also don't really come to any big conclusions, you kind of just leave it to the viewer, like you said. And I, and I think that was a really smart way to do it because there was so much that was just not, you, that you couldn't confirm. And so instead of going for kind of a, a definitive answer, you just kind of let these people's characters and their contradictions speak for themselves. And I think that was the more powerful choice. I think you did a really good job there. Uh, so with documentaries as an, as an art form and as a genre, I mean, what about them do you appreciate or, or admire most? Well, I, I, I grew up loving do certain documentaries. Um, I loved Herzog's films, Varda. I love Varda's docs and the Maisel brothers and Wiseman. Of course, in recent time, you know, Joshua Oppenheimer, who became a friend. And, you know, I, I just love going into worlds I don't know about and meeting people I don't know. And I've tried to do that in a lot of my own fiction films, just diving into worlds, researching them, meeting people, uncovering the truth about them or their occupation or the, the neighborhood they live in like in Chomp Shop or in 99 Homes. And um, so I'm looking forward to making more nonfiction films, basically as, a, as an opportunity to do that. You know, oftentimes I think journalists have such an enviable job because they get to go and meet people and go into worlds that they never would have access to otherwise, you know? And, and I think it's just kind of a lucky, a lucky job I have that I get to do that. 
So is, is your process for kind of sourcing, not sourcing, but like gathering information for projects, like between man push cart and chop shop versus, um, versus second chance, does that process different? Were there, were there like, what were kind of some of the different requirements of this project versus those? I mean, the meeting of the people and asking them questions is very similar. You know, um, if I had carried a camera with me on Chop Shop or Man Push Carter 99 Homes, there would have been a documentary could have easily been made about all those subjects. You know, I'm researching something now for an original story. Because of COVID, I'm doing a lot of it by phone. But once I can go meet them, or if I had recorded the audio of those conversations, it would be a podcast, you know. Um, of course, the difference is with the fiction film, you can... I can take, you know, three characters that I've met and turn them into one person, you know, and then you fictionalize things that, that they didn't really do, or you invent scenarios. But I've always, in my own original work, I've always been drawn to being inspired from real people in real situations to, to create the fictional version of the story. I mean, most everything in 99 Homes was, were things that I had seen. The events, the scams, all that I saw the character, you know, Shannon's character is based on someone that I met, that Mike Shannon met, that Andrew Garfield met, you know. Um, so, and to me, I find it more inspiring than anything else is, is the reality. Absolutely. When, and a lot of fiction is rooted in some kind of truth. You know, it's, you, you're drawing from things that you, you know, or that, you know, things that actually happened. Um, can you tease this next project of yours? Is it like, how kind of far along are you? No, we're still writing. Yeah. Well, awesome. Yeah. So, so this is my last question for you. Um, what were, um, expand on kind of what the biggest lessons or themes of, of Second Chance are. I think it's about, um, in some ways, it's about a friendship. It's about um, deception. It's about what happens, you know, what is the journey from creating something so in a way so good and so useful to people and how does that turn into something that you know ends up hurting a lot of people how, how does that happen um and what wh where are we now in terms of truth power impunity you know wh where do we stand with those those concepts and ideas in the country i i often thought about it as some modern version of arthur miller's all my sons i don't know if you're familiar with the play but the father's making, yeah, the father's making airplanes in the war. The son realizes that there's faulty parts in these airplanes and soldiers are dying. And um, the father's not said anything about it. He didn't do a recall, let's say, similar to the story we have in Second Chance. And in that story, it, it's, it's Arthur Miller. So he goes straight into moral forces, right? He was very, you know, tragic in that way um, in his thinking. And um, here, you know, something similar happened, but there don't seem to be really many consequences for what happened. And another company gets created with, you know, with products. So I thought, found that so telling of the shift in where we've gone from, from 60 years ago to today, what we believe, what we want to believe. So, yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time. I, I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, the, the movie is great. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks for speaking.